All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we're going to start our first lesson on our new unit, energy. Uh, this is pretty exciting, and I think you're going to like it because, in general, I think that energy is a lot easier concept for students to wrap their head around. And generally, I think the problems are a lot easier than things like two-dimensional motion, just because you don't have to worry about what direction things are and... Um, the math just tends to be a little bit simpler. So we're going to do a couple examples today involving energy. Um, we'll talk about what work and energy are. And then um, we'll, we'll maybe contrast how much work is going to be to solve some of these problems with forces and kinematics as opposed to energy, just to kind of illustrate like the benefit of choosing to use energy when possible. All right. So before we dive into our examples and stuff, let's go ahead and take a look at vocabulary. So I have tried to f like look up a definition for energy, and I find energy is one of the most poorly defined things in physics, which is a shame because it's one of the most important ideas in physics. So it seems bizarre to not have um a good definition um and i think the problem with energy is it's not a thing that you just find laying around your house you can't like point at a thing on a kitchen table and say oh look there's an energy right it's a very invisible abstract thing sometimes it's purely based on the location of something and just looking at the object you can't tell how much energy it has so this is the best definition that I can come up with. Um, and I feel like it fits pretty well if you don't think too hard about really niche cases. Um, but let's check it out. So energy is a scalar quantity that describes how something is moving or how much potential an object has to move. So there's really two big parts there. Um, Maybe maybe not how something is moving, but maybe more like how much something is moving. Um, there are tons of different types of energy, but for this class, we're going to focus only on mechanical types of energy. We'll talk about all the different types of energy on another slide, but in this class, we're gonna really limit our focus of study to just the mechanical ones. Um, because some of the other ones are really hard to define or calculate, and they don't really have anything to do with motion of masses through space, which is really what we are trying to study in this class. Um, an important thing that we want to note here is that energy is a scalar, meaning it is directionless. And that means you can't say you have eight energy up. That, that doesn't make sense. That's not a thing. You just have eight units of energy. Um, I suppose it would be helpful if we knew what the units of energy were. The units for energy are joules, uh, maybe joules if you're French, or houles, or I don't know joules um and the abbreviation for joules is just a capital j so this is the unit for energy um one joule is equal to one kilogram uh meter squared per second squared this is like the big breakdown this is and we'll look at it a little bit more when we get the formulas but this is what a joule is. It's a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Um, but this is a mouthful, so we'll just use the uh, SI unit of joules. All right. The next thing we're going to need to talk about is this idea called work. And work is the process of transferring energy into or out of an object. Um, if we are adding energy to a system, that will be a positive work. Uh, I'll do eight work on something. 
Um, if you are taking energy from a system, typically we denote that as negative work. Um, so work is just the transference of energy into or out of a system. And our system could be a box, it could be something attached to a spring, it could be a satellite floating in orbit around the Earth, it could be a lot of different things. Um, so yeah, and uh, we'll, we'll get one more little like addendum to this, but we need to look at the formula. Okay? When we are looking at mechanical energy today, we are going to limit this to just kinetic energy. I don't want to overwhelm you with all the different types of mechanical energy all in one sitting. I want to just have you get the idea of what is energy and what does it mean to do work today. So we're going to just look at kinetic energy, which is the amount of energy an object has because it is moving. So anytime you have an object with a non-zero velocity, it has kinetic energy. Um, wonderful. Yeah, great. We've got all our vocabulary down. So let's take a little uh, time to talk about the different types of energy that exist um, that we might not really calculate or like study in depth in this class. Some of them will come up a little bit, but they're not going to be like the main focus of any particular lesson or unit. So um, types of energy that we will study. We're going to study the energy of motion, which is kinetic energy. We're going to learn to calculate that today and how to use that to solve problems. Um, there are uh, also energies stored in fields. So if you have an electron in an electromagnetic field, then it has some energy because if you let go of it, the field will interact with the particle and make it start to move. So we say that there's potential energy because as soon as we release the object, it'll start to move, ergo it turns into kinetic energy. Um, there is energy stored in chemical bonds. Um, this is the energy you release when you burn fuel. Um, when you have gasoline in your car and it's ignited in the engine and it turns into fire and pressure and expands and pushes your motor and makes your car go, you're taking advantage of chemical energy and the energy released by the bonds of uh, hydrocarbons. We also have solar energy. This is maybe a teeny tiny bit misleading, but um, we'll call it solar energy. Really, it's just light in general. Light is actually a packet of pure energy. Um, we call these little packets of pure energy um, photons. Energy, sorry, I can't spell and t talk at the same time. Um, light is pure energy. That's why when you have a light on you, it feels warm. That's energy being transferred to your skin by the light. Um, this is the energy that plants eat when they are hit by sunlight. Um, this is sort of the energy that we get from the sun. Um, yeah. You know, solar energy is the stuff that our government should start investing in so that we don't, you know, all it might be too late. We might be doomed already. But anyway, I digress. We're getting a little too political there. Um, there is energy stored in mass. Like just the fact that something is made of matter means that there is some energy in that matter. Um, this is more like energy instead of the bond between uh, hydrogens and oxygens um, or carbon chains, right? Um, instead of the energy stored in these bonds between separate molecules or uh, sorry, atoms, there's energy stored within an individual atom in the nucleus with the protons and neutrons. That energy we call nuclear energy because it's stored in the nucleus of an atom. And this is where the energy of the sun comes from. The atoms inside a sun are undergoing fusion, meaning hydrogens are turning into heliums. 
And then heliums are turning into, I forget what the next one is. I don't know how, what helium fuses into. Probably heavier metals, carbons, oxygens, things like that. All the way up to lead, which is PB, I believe. Um, when these bonds are formed, there is energy released in the form of nuclear energy. And usually that's emitted as like gamma rays or x-rays. Those gamma rays and x-rays are actually light on a spectrum that you can't see. So these nuclear interactions of these uh, atoms turning into different atoms and fusing together are releasing packets of light in the form of x-rays and gamma rays and stuff, which is pure energy. Okay, the last type of energy is heat or temperature or something being hot. Um, if you have um, a pot of, say, uh, boiling water, then this boiling water here, that's water if you can tell, this pot of boiling water has more energy in it than a pot of cold water. Um, if you stick your hand in it, it will transfer that energy to your hand and do damage to your cells uh, because it's transferring a bunch of energy. Because from chemistry, we know that something being hot just means that if we look at all of our atoms, hotness is just how much these atoms are jiggling around in there. It's how fast they're moving. So heat, you can kind of think about as another type of kinetic energy. It's just kinetic energy on a very small scale. So usually we kind of think of it as a little bit different, right? We, we think of um, a car rolling down the road being different than a pot of water boiling. Um, we think of those as two different types of heat because we have to calculate them in different ways and things to that uh, nature. But in reality, heat and temperature is just jostling atoms. And the faster they jostle, the faster they move, the more energy they have. So um, there's actually one other type of energy um, that we haven't talked about that I forgot on this list. Let's add it. There is elastic energy. Um, elastic energy happens in things like um, uh, crossbows. If you've got your crossbow like this, and you've got your bolt or your like crossbow arrow, uh, this stretched cord here and this bent metal is elastic. And if I release it, if I take this hook and flip it so that this cord throws the bolt, you can take the bolt and now it's moving really fast. We've converted some elastic property of material into motion, which is kinetic energy. So the last type is elastic. The three types of energy that we are going to focus on for this class are, of course, kinetic energy, potential energy stored in fields, namely the gravitational field, we're not going to look at the electrical field so much because it gets a little wonky and you it's almost impossible to talk about that stuff without knowledge of calculus, particularly three-dimensional vector calculus. And elastic energy in springs, which is kind of why we talked about Hooke's Law earlier, so that we can incorporate that into our discussion of energy. So today we're just going to focus on the kinetic energy and the definition of work. Um, but we'll get to these other types of energy in a few lessons. So for our formulas today, our formulas are the kinetic energy is equal to one half the mass of an object. And this is the object that's moving that we're curious, how much kinetic energy does that car have? How much kinetic energy does the baseball have? The thing that is moving, that is the mass we plug in here, times the velocity squared. And this is not a component of velocity. This is the velocity. So even if our velocity is at an angle, it's the length of this vector here. 
All right, so that is our formula for kinetic energy. Um, it is, of course, uh, not equals. Don't put equals. That sounds weird. Um, it's measured in joules because it is a type of energy. Joules. There we go. So that is our formula for kinetic energy. Not too bad. Um, pretty nice. You'll like it. I promise. The next formula we're going to look at is the work formula. So work is also a scalar because it's measuring how much energy is going into or out of something. Um, and our formula for work is force times distance. There's something important we have to talk about as far as these, the force and the distance are concerned though. The force, it has this little subscript of X, meaning that the we only care about how much force sorry i've been gesturing and my pen hasn't been showing up how strange um we only care about the force that is in the same direction as the displacement and i've got an example for this but if your force is not in the same direction as the way you're moving then we say that there is no work done there's also a small addition we need to put on this formula to make it really give us the full effect and power that it has. And work is equal to the change in energy of a system. So if the total amount of energy in the system changes, we would say that there has been work done on the system. Um, so you can either think about work as the, the input or output of energy from a system, or you can think about it as the total change of energy in the system. Either way will work. So here's our two formulas. Um, we are going to use these to simplify some very hard kinematics problems and make them a little bit simpler for us. So let's, uh, let's go take a peek. All right. Um, before we get into like really rough calculations, I want to just really make sure we're emphasizing this idea of the displacement and the force being done in the same direction. So we have this box, we have a rope pulling it, a box is being dragged across a rough surface at a constant velocity. The box is being dragged uh, by a rope that's at 45 degree angle, which forces, if any, do work on the box. So we're going to go ahead and assume that the velocity is in that direction um, parallel to the ground. So the first thing we want to do is draw a force diagram for this box so that we have an understanding of what forces are acting on it, and then we'll figure out which ones are doing work. So we, of course, have the weight down. We have the tension from our rope that way. Um, as long as the tension doesn't cancel out the weight perfectly, we can say that there's a little bit of normal force here. And it says we're on a rough surface. So if we're moving to the right, that means we're going to have some kinetic friction to the left. All right. So here's our force diagram. Now we want to say which forces do work and which forces uh, don't do work. Don't work. Okay. So we're going to just make a list of which ones are doing work. So if we look at our normal force, our normal force is straight up. And that is perpendicular to our velocity. Velocity is telling us our change in direction over change in time. So because velocity is made in change in direction, it's safe to say that your delta x is in the same direction as a velocity. So because our normal force is perpendicular to the direction we're moving, it does no work. So we're gonna put our normal force under the no work category. Likewise with our weight, our weight is also perpendicular to the velocity. So our weight will be doing no work on the system. All right, our friction 
is in the opposite direction of our velocity. Because it's in the same plane though, it's in the x direction, it's in the horizontal direction, just because it's not pointing to the right with velocity, it is going to do work because it's in the same line of direction, right? It's anti-parallel, that counts, that's the same direction. So friction will, uh, whoops, sorry, I can't spell friction apparently. Friction will be doing work and specifically because our friction is in the negative direction and our displacement is in the positive direction, friction is going to do negative work on the system. It's going to be taking energy out of the system, which makes sense, right? We think about friction as the, the killer of momentum. It takes all of our motion out of um, systems by just gradually grinding them to a halt. So generally, when you see friction, it will be doing negative work, usually. I don't want to say always because only Sith and uh, presidents of the United States deal in absolutes. Um, so I'm not going to say it always does negative work. I'm sure we could contrive a weird system so that it's not, but usually it will be. All right, let's talk about this tension. So our tension is at an angle. What that means is that our tension has an x component and our tension has a y component. Our tension will do work uh, because part of its uh, force or part of its components are in the same direction as the x. Specifically, it will do positive work because it's pulling the same direction that our displacement is. But it's maybe important to break it down a little bit. If we're trying to figure out how much work tension does, we cannot include any of the y component because the y component is perpendicular to our displacement. We would only be looking at the x component. So if you want to, we could say tension in the x direction will do work. Tension uh, in the y direction will not do any work because it's perpendicular to your motion. So tension as a whole, we can say tension is doing work. This string is definitely doing some work on the system because its x direction is doing work. However, we need to make sure we're not looking at any part of the y direction. So we'll have to do a little bit of our vector decomposition and break into components. All right, good questions. No questions? Excellent. All right. Um, if you do have questions, make sure you ask me about them. Don't just sit here and blindly accept everything and be like, well, but what about this thing? What about these things? Go ask me. All right. So we've identified what will and won't do work. Let's go use this to calculate some stuff. All right. So solving problems with energy. Um, we have a box that is initially at rest and is then pulled across a rough surface by a rope. The box weighs 80 newtons and the rope has a tension of 50 newtons. The coefficient of kinetic friction is 0.3. So that's the, the rough surface. Find out how fast the box is traveling after being dragged 12 meters. All right, so let me, um, let me show you how we would do this problem if we're not using energy. Then I'm gonna redo the problem using energy to really show you the strengths of this idea in physics. So let's draw our box. We have a box, it's initially at rest. That means velocity, uh, velocity initial equals zero and is pulled along a rough surface by a rope. Um, it doesn't give me an angle for the rope, so I'm gonna go ahead and assume that our rope is horizontal. So this is our tension. Here's the surface. Um, it should be flat, but I can't draw straight lines. It says the box weighs 80 newtons. So we have 80 newtons. That is a weight, not a mass, because it's in newtons, and also the word weighs. Um, we would have to divide this by 10 or by g to solve for mass if we need it. The coefficient of friction is 
point three. Um, it says that we're going to be pulling across a rough surface, so we're assuming it's sliding. So I just gave you the kinetic. We're not really going to need the static. Um, so we need to find out how fast is the box traveling after it's been dragged 12 meters. So starting here, then we go 12 meters in that direction. We want to know what is our final velocity. Okay. So if we want to just solve this a way that we know how, and you are capable of solving this right now, you don't need to know any more information. We're just looking at a system that we're familiar with so that we can apply a new concept comfortably. So let me show you how we would do this the old fashioned way, then we'll redo the whole thing with energy. So the old fashioned way, I know some forces on this. So my first instinct would be to draw a force diagram. We have weight down, we have our normal force up, we have our tension to the right, and we have friction backwards, friction kinetic specifically. They tell us that the weight is equal to 80 newtons. This is gonna balance with our normal force because there's nothing else in the y direction. And it doesn't say the box is coming up off the ground. So we get to assume they're balanced because of Newton's first law. They tell us the tension is equal to 50 newtons and they don't tell us the friction kinetic. So we're gonna have to use mu times the normal force to calculate that. We want to know what is the velocity horizontally, because that's the only direction we're moving. So it makes sense to me that we're going to need to find an acceleration. So let's look at our sum of forces in the x direction. And we're going to solve for the acceleration of this box. So we have tension minus friction equals mass times acceleration. Our tension is 50 newtons. Our friction is 0.3 times 80. That's going to be 24 newtons. Let's fill that in, 24 newtons. And that equals mass times acceleration. Our mass is equal to the uh, weight, or sorry, we can solve our mass by looking at weight. Divide by G. So mass is going to be 8 if we divide by our 10 for G. So we have uh, 50 minus 24 is 26 equals 8A. Divide by 8. Uh, this reduces, I'm sure. Um, 13 over 4, which is 3.25. So 3.25 meters per second squared is our acceleration. Um, now, we need to somehow use this acceleration, our displacement, and our initial velocity to find a final velocity. So let me change colors here so we can kind of show that we're entering a new step in our problem solving process. Let's look at our kinematics equations. We have our final position equals initial position plus velocity initial times time plus one half acceleration times t squared. We also have velocity final equals velocity initial plus acceleration times time. Um, the problem here is we don't have um, our time. We don't know how long it takes us to cover those 12 meters. Um, we can solve it with this. Um, if we look at our unknowns here, we know the final position, it's 12. The initial position we can cancel out and just say it's zero. Our initial velocities we can cancel out because it tells us we start from rest and it's zero. And we have our acceleration right here. So the only unknown is time and final velocity. So we have two unknowns and two equations. This is easy for us to solve. Um, so let's simplify these a little bit. Um, we have x final equals one half acceleration times time squared. And we have v final equals acceleration times time. What we're gonna do is we're going to solve this for time and then plug 
but let's solve it for time. So time equals V final over acceleration. Now we substitute this into our simplified position equation. So that eliminates the time and we don't need to know that anymore. So we have x final equals one half acceleration times v final over acceleration squared. Simplifying our exponents, we can distribute the exponent of the two onto both of our variables and we get one half acceleration times velocity final squared over acceleration squared. And then this acceleration can cancel with one of these. And what we get is velocity final squared over two A. All right, now let's just go ahead and plug in our numbers. Um, and we have um, x final is 12 equals v final squared, that's what we're looking for, over 2 times 3.25. So this is going to be uh, v final squared over 6.5. Multiply that to the other side, times 6.5, times 6.5. Um, what is that? 78, I think. 78 equals v squared. And then we take a square root. Uh, pardon, my calculator is uh, working. It's thinking still. Or I have a slow calculator. Uh, so our velocity is about 8.83 .8 meters per second. What a doozy, right? Like if we do this conventionally, using forces, solving for acceleration, and then beating it to death with our kinematic equations, this problem is a very challenging problem. Okay. Let's get rid of this. Uh, let me actually, here, let's, I wanna save some of it. I wanna save this stuff. Let's lock this down, lock, uh, lock in place, clear. Okay, so let's start the problem over and this time we're gonna use energy. So if we look at our forces, we of course have the normal force up, we have the weight down, but because they are perpendicular to the direction we're moving, they do no work, so we get to ignore them. The only forces doing work are going to be our tension and our friction kinetic. All right. So what we're going to find is the work done by tension, and we're gonna subtract the work done by friction, and that will tell us our total amount of work done on the system. Our work equals the change in energy, and the energy we're talking about here is we're starting at rest and then we're moving. So the type of energy we're getting in this system is kinetic energy. So let's go ahead and find the work done by tension, the work done by friction, and then we'll set that equal to our kinetic energy formula and see if we can find our um, velocity a little simpler. So work done by tension. Work, remember, is just force times distance. So the force of tension 80 newtons. Oh, pardon me. No, it's not. That's the weight. It's a uh, 50 newtons, 50 newtons. And we're going 12 meters. That seems really easy. Minus, we said our force of friction is the 80 newtons of our normal force times 0.3 is 24. So 24 times 12 for our 12 meters. That's going to be our change in energy. All right, so let's simplify this. Um, so we have 50 times 12 is 600. 24 times 12 is, uh, whoops, 288. 
So 600 minus 288, we have 312 joules of work being done on our system. And that is the change in kinetic energy. So we started with zero kinetic energy, right? Change in something is just final minus initial. Because we started at rest, initial kinetic energy is zero because one half mv squared, the v is zero, so the whole thing is zero. So the work done is equal to the final amount of kinetic energy. So it's gonna tell us the kinetic energy of the system. So we did 312 joules of work. That equals one half times the mass of the block times the velocity final squared. So times two, we have 624 equals the mass we said is eight kilograms v final squared divide by eight so 624 divided by eight is 78 equals v squared take a square root and we already know the answer because we did it before our final velocity is 8.83 meters per second so this greatly simplifies. We didn't have to look at force diagrams. We really just had to look at what forces are doing work. Calculate the work done by both of them and add them up to get the total amount of work done on our system. And then we set that equal to our change in energy because that's just the definition. Work is the change in energy of a system. And we kind of thought about it a little bit and we said, all right, uh, the type of energy we're getting out of this work is kinetic energy. We're making the box move. So we set it equal to our kinetic energy. And then this problem was a lot easier for us to solve than that substituting all that stuff in with kinematics equations. All right, so that's kind of the power of energy. It makes our problems much easier um, and we don't have to worry about too much. So let's go ahead and look at maybe a slightly harder problem and then um, We'll send you on your way and you guys can go practice. So it says Mr. Barton is riding a bike and has to stop suddenly. He slams on the brakes and the bike begins to skid. Mr. Barton and the bike have a combined mass of 85 kilograms. And the coefficient of kinetic friction between the wheels and the asphalt is 1.1. How far will Mr. Barton skid before he comes to a stop? All right. So if we look at my force diagram, we have the weight of me and the bike down. We have the normal force of the asphalt supporting us so that we don't like sink into the earth. And then we have the friction of my wheels skidding ac across the asphalt. The thing that I think a lot of students are going to be really tempted to do here is to put maybe a force of brakes on this do not do that the reason we don't do that is because the brakes are like little clamps that go on your wheel and they pinch your wheel but the brakes are part of the bike itself you can't have an object exert a force on itself and then um accelerate right like take your hand and push on your face. You're, you're pushing on your face, but you're not, your face isn't accelerating and your hand isn't accelerating. It, it's because that's all one thing. It's you, it's all connected. So it can't exert forces on itself. The force of brakes really, if you wanna get nitpicky about what's happening is it's like an internal friction and it's converting some of our kinetic energy into heat energy but that's why we're not looking at braking right we're looking at skidding meaning the brakes aren't even rubbing they've pinched it so tight the wheel quit spinning and now it's sliding on the asphalt it just simplifies the problem however we cannot put a force of brakes on our force diagram because because uh why is that because it's an internal force, um, so we don't put it. 
All right, now that we're done arguing about that. Um, so we want to use energy here. We know that work equals, oh, I didn't tell you how fast I'm going. Let's go ahead and assume that I'm going, what's a, what's a nice speed? Um, let's say I'm going mm, 10 meters per second. Okay. Um, we need that to be able to solve the problem. All right. Um, so we know that work equals force times distance, and it equals our change in energy. Okay. So we need to ask ourselves a couple of things. The first thing we need to ask ourselves is which forces are doing work here? Well, I'm sliding that way. My velocity is forward. So the normal force and the weight do no work because they're perpendicular to the direction of motion. The only one doing work here is friction and it's backwards compared to the way that I'm moving. So it's gonna do negative work. Um, the way we can see that is if we plug in our force of friction. So let's see, uh, let's start finding a couple of values just so we can start plugging some stuff in. Our weight is gonna be our mass. So 85 kilograms times G of 10. So it's gonna be 850. That means our normal force will be 850 newtons. And then our friction is our normal force times our coefficient of friction. So times 1.1. Let's do 850 times 1.1. Oops, 850, not 50. Um, so our friction is going to be 935 newtons. The way we can see that is our friction, the way we've defined it, we said to the right is positive, backwards is negative. So the force of friction needs to be negative. So we have negative 935 times x. And x is what we're looking for. How far does Mr. Barton skid on his bike? Okay, so we have our work set up. We have the force. We're looking for this placement. It seems like we need to know some information about this energy. So let's see if we can kind of figure out our energy. While I'm riding my bike, I'm moving. That would tell me that I have a kinetic energy. So my initial energy is equal to my kinetic energy. My final energy, I'm skidding to a stop. If I stop, that means there's no energy left, right? There's no more kinetic energy. So E final will be zero. Okay. So if we look at change in energy, change in energy is E final minus E initial. This is zero. So whatever my initial energy is, the kinetic energy, I'm going to make it negative and then the negative signs will cancel out. All this is saying is that I had some energy at the beginning. I took energy out because my force is in the opposite direction of motion. I'm doing negative work on the system. And now my final is zero and I've removed all the energy from the system. So let's figure out our initial kinetic energy. We have negative 935 X equals negative one half times the mass of the system times the velocity squared. This is the equation for kinetic energy, and it's negative because of how we calculate changes in things. It's always final minus initial. So this minus sign is from the minus in the equation. Our mass is 85, and then our velocity is 10. So we have negative 935x equals negative 1 half times 85 is 42.5 times 10 squared is 100. So we have negative 935x, and now we're just doing math. We're not really doing physics anymore, which is sad, but oh well. So now we divide by our negative 935, and we grab a calculator. Uh, 4,250 divided by 935 is x equals about 
4.55 meters. Not too bad. That's pretty quick, right? For going 16 miles an hour or so, uh, I can stop in just, just five meters. I don't know. That's like, mm, like 15 feet. I don't know. That's like the length of a long truck, maybe. So as long as I have a long truck, I should be uh, good. Hopefully, I don't have to stop too quickly. Um, otherwise, I might be in trouble. But oh. All right. So that's kind of how we're going to use energy and work. Um, if you feel like you need more help, more examples, anything like that, please let me know. Um, and you can go ahead and find your uh, homework on Canvas. Have fun.